Masechet Gitin, Daf Yod Tet, and today is all about inks. Mishnah teaches, Bakol Kotvin, you can use any ink to write a get. Bidyo, Besam, Besikra, Komos, Ubekan Kantom, Ubekhol Davar, Shehu Shel Kayama. You can use any type of ink, including Dyo, which is just regular ink, Sam is paint. Sikra is red paint, uh, here you go, or known as red lead. And uh, komos is uh, some kind of gum resin, and kankantom is copper sulfate. But anything that leaves a permanent mark, uh, so a get has to be written with permanent in ink, you can't write it in pencil. Uh, or anything else that's going to rub off. This is an important document and it needs to be around for a while. And kotvin lo bemashkin velo bemeperot velo bechol davar she'en no mitkayam. On the other hand, you cannot write with other liquids or fruit juice or other things that will not leave permanent writing. If it's just fruit juice, it's going to dry and then you won't be able to read anything after that. Um, so that's inks. Now writing materials, al hakol kotvin, al he'ale shel zayit, ve'al hakeren shel para ve'noten la eta para, ve'al yad shel aybed ve'noten la eta aybed. You can use any writing material, including an olive leaf. People used to write on leaves, and an olive leaf is particularly strong and durable and will stay around for a while, but you can't write on things like an onion skin that's going to dry up in a, in a short time. You can write on the horn of a cow while it's still attached to the cow. The uh, horn is very good, sturdy, permanent writing material. Of course, since the husband has to give the get to the wife, he's going to have to give her the entire cow. Um, so that's fine. Um, you can also write on the hand of a slave. It would have to be some kind of a permanent writing on his hand. Um, and then in that case, he would have to uh, give over to her, uh, not just his hand, but also the entire slave. Um, so why would you do that? I'm not sure, but sometimes uh, you don't have other writing materials on hand. Uh, excuse the pun. Rabbi Yosei Gali disagrees and says, you cannot write on something that is alive. So sorry, you cannot write it on the cow or on the slave. And also you cannot use food. Uh, rather, you have to use some kind of, you know, parchment or other, uh, uh, almost anything else, um, but, but not not these items. All right, that's the Mishnah. Now the Gemara is going to analyze the inks. Dio, Diota, it's going to translate the Hebrew terms into the more familiar Aramaic. Uh, sam, Sama, is if you want to a lot of words, if you want to change them from Hebrew to Aramaic, you just add an Aleph at the end. An Aleph at the end of a word in Aramaic is like putting a Heha Yidi'a, like Hasam. Um, sikra, Amar Rabba Babar Hana, Sikreta Shema. So this is the red dye in Aramaic, it's called Sikreta. Komos is Kuma in Aramaic. Kan Kanto, Amar Rabba Babar Hana, Mashmuel Charta De Ush Kafe, the black uh, substance used by cobblers, which is copper sulfate. Good. And you can use, in fact, anything else that is permanent. The Mishnah is adding this as a generality. So what is that coming to include? That extra phrase, uh, Rabbi Hanina taught that if you use metiria and is, uh, uh, is two explanations, either uh, some kind of rainwater that gets mixed in with mud, or um, uh, gall, uh, something that was uh, where gall nuts were uh, soaked. And uh, now afsa is also something with gall nuts. So maybe it means uh, one is that's cooked in gall nuts, and the other one is that's uh, soaked in gall nuts. Gall nuts are soaked in it. Um, what are gall nuts uh, in any case? Here are a picture of some gall nuts. They um, grow on oak trees. And so this is used in making ink. Gall is a kind of a growth or fungus, uh, a tumor that grows on plants. It's uh, kind of disgusting and uh, it's kind of cancer for, um, for plants, but um, is actually useful for ink. So we have gall and gall nuts, which will be um, useful. So Rabbi Hanina says, yes, you can use this water that's soaked in gall nuts. That says if you write it with lead or coals or black paint, also those are permanent uh, types of ink. Itmar, Hamavir Dio al Gabe Sikra be Shabbat. And now we're going to compare the laws of writing of Get to the laws of writing for Shabbat, in which uh, where it's you're not allowed to write two letters. Uh, so let's say someone writes in normal black ink 
on top of red dye, Sikra is the red dye. Uh, so the red is kind of like if you write with ma markers and you write something with yellow marker, and then you write with a black marker after that. So basically covers over the yellow that was there before completely. Um, so if you do that, what would be the law uh, regarding Shabbat? Um, the person in the times of the Bet HaMikdash would have to bring two Korban Hatat offerings. One for writing and one for erasing. Uh, erasing is because there was yellow uh, there, in the red, I mean, there was red there underneath. The red is lighter. And now by covering over it, he is uh, erasing uh, the red. It can no longer be seen. And in addition, he's writing uh, black, which is now going to totally cover it. And you're writing two letters. So then, uh, of course, if you do it by mistake, not knowing, uh, then you have to bring a korban hatat. However, if you retrace something that's already already written there with the same color, so you black on black or red on top of red, patur, because there is no change. You're not erasing what was there before. You're not writing anything new. There's no. It looks the same as it did before. Uh, so everyone agrees in that case. However, we have a machlok in the case of sikra al gabedio. If you write with the red on top of the black. Uh, in that case, uh, the black will still be seen because the red is not completely um, covering over the black, uh, but it will kind of diminish the black color. And so what's the case there? Amri la chayav, amri la patur. Some say chayav and some say patur. Let's explain why. Amri la chayav mocheku. The one who says chayav would say that's actually causing erasing. You had beautiful black uh, 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 letters there, and then you come put the red on it. It's not a total erasure, but it is a partial erasure um, because now you're making it lighter than it was before. And others say, Amri la patur mekelkel, who some say knows patur because you're destroying. When you talk about uh, erasing, one is only liable for erasing on Shabbat if you're erasing for the purpose of writing. So, for example, you had a, a piece of parchment with writing on it, and you want to make room because you want to write something else, and so you erase in order to use that space to write something else. That would be a typical example. Above also, we had another example where um, you're tracing, so the erasing, you're tracing black on top of red, and in that case, the erasing uh, helps one to write the new letter right on top of it, and so that's also erasing uh, the very spot where one is writing. So the erase, erasing is needed in order to help the writing. In that case, it would be chayav. Uh, but in this case here, where um, the, the, the new writing is actually undoing uh, as a partial erasure of the nice black ink that was there before, so that's just a destructive type of erasing, which is patur on Shabbat. And now, an interesting question. Resh Akish asks Rabbi Yochanan. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan and Resh Akish were agreeing until now regarding uh, Hilchot Shabbat. So now, trying to apply this to the laws of writing a get, uh, what if you have witnesses that don't know how to write their names? They're uh, basically you know, you know, more or less illiterate. Um, and uh, but they know how to trace uh, if you if there's something there already. Um, so can they uh, write uh, on sikra um, that someone else will write for them with sikra red? And so someone who doesn't know how to write, um, but maybe is uh, the sofet himself or, or a relative and can, is not acting as a witness, um, will write their names in red ink. And then the two witnesses, who are kosher witnesses, except that they don't know how to sign their names, they will trace over the red ink with blank, a black ink. Is that good? Ketav elyon ketav, or en eno ketav. Do we consider the upper black ink as writing, or is it not considered writing because it's goes just going on top of writing that was already there? And Rabbi Yochanan answered, Amar le eno ketav. This is not considered writing. You can't write on top of uh, something that's already written. That's not called writing because it was already there. Um, so these, that signature is not valid. Reshakish, uh, however, counters, Hold on, Reshakish says to his colleague and teacher, uh, Rabbi Yochanan, you taught us yourself that regarding Shabbat, the upper writing is considered writing. In this exact case, if you had red letters written with red, 
and then someone comes on Shabbat and writes on top of them, he is liable twice for erasing the red, and he is liable for writing. So we see that writing black on top of red is considered writing for Shabbat, and therefore should be considered writing also for a get, and these signatures should be valid. I like how Shakish is asking the question, even though he already has an opinion about the answer. So Rabbi Yochanan gives an answer. He says, no, I don't like your answer. You're contradicting yourself. Rabbi Yochanan counters with a very, very important line. He says, just because we are comparing things, we should actually do an action. In other words, regarding al Shabbat, we were speaking theoretically, right? Dome, it seems that to me that if one would write black on red, you'd have to bring two, uh, two sacrifices. But that we just no better mikdash now. No one's bringing sacrifices anyway, right? This is not an actual case. We're just thinking, thinking out loud. You know, black on top of red. It seems like that should be erasing plus writing. That we were talking about theoretical discussion we had in the classroom. Now, you can't take this to the next step and actually apply this, first of all, to a different area from al Shabbat to al Kitin. There may be differences there. And you can't just take a theoretical musing that we, we taught and actually apply it in a real case if you had actual witnesses there and you wanted to help them out. Many people were illiterate. Probably most people wouldn't even know how to write back then, um, and now all of a sudden say that, uh, well, because Rabbi Yochanan said this in the shiur one time when he was thinking about al uh, Shabbat in the theoretical sense, you're actually going to do a ma'aseh? I didn't mean that. Okay, that's a very important line because I think it reflects on so much of the Talmudic discussion uh, when the rabbis are talking about different topics that are, some of them are relevant, some of them are not relevant, that these are, these are mostly theoretical discussions, and when you're going to come to actually practice it, well, then you have to really, you know, think through uh, all the different opinions and the practice and all the considerations. Uh, but we can, we should understand most of the Talmudic back and forth as, in fact, uh, a th- a theoretical uh, uh, um, uh, discussion, possibilities, um, opening opening different things for for discussion and argument, uh, but not uh, but not uh, at all the bottom line absolute uh, um, uh, one single conclusion. Okay, itmar edim shen shen yodim lachtom. Now on this topic that you just opened, that witnesses don't know how to sign. Rav Amar mekadrin lahem niyad halakum aline takiraim deyo. Rav says no problem. You make a stencil for them. You take a blank piece of paper and you, someone who does know how to write, will cut out their name, and then you put the name onto the get, and they just they could just like brush over. Kind of like screen printing um, uh, uh, on top of the stencil. You take the stencil off, and there you go. You have a beautiful name for them. Others say it can mean like etching that you can etch uh, uh, onto the um, the the, the uh, parchment itself, um, and then fill in, in into the etching. But it seems like it is from the language here is talking about a stencil. Shmuel Amar Ba'avad. Shmuel says you can write their name with lead uh, because lead. Think of like a lead pencil. Our, our pencils today are not actually lead, but once upon a same time, I guess they were, um, but that is a temporary writing, so that's okay. You put lead on it, and then they'll come and uh, cover over the lead, uh, trace over the lead with permanent ink, and so Shemel says that is a, a, a another way that you can help out witnesses who don't know how to write their name. Now we ask, How can you say that you can write lead and then they can write over that? Because Rabbi Chaya, Rabbi Chaya had a Braita that we saw earlier that someone writes with lead or coal or back black paint that is kosher writing. In other words, that is itself permanent writing. And so therefore the scribe who's uh, writing with lead is already writing and writing on top of writing is no good. So we have to, you have to write with something light, like if you wrote with uh, fruit juice um, and then you covered over the fruit juice, that would be better. Um, but how could you write with lead um, to, in order for the witness to trace over? And the answer is, <laughs> Oh, when, uh, when we, uh, we were saying that you, Shemuel said you can write on top of it, that was lead itself. If you just put plain old lead on it, it'll just flake off. And uh, that is not permanent. So Shemuel said, "Put just straight lead, and then write, then uh, put paint, put ink over it, and that's okay." When Nabi Chaya in his Baraita was talking, he was talking about lead water that you put lead in water, mix it, and it, it um, goes into the water, and that makes ink that is permanent. 
And so interestingly, the water, the lead in water um, actually uh, is more effective than plain lead just by itself. Rabbi Abu Amal Beme Milin. Rabbi Abu says uh, you can use this gall water and uh, le- they, the scribe will write the name of the witness in the gall water and then uh, that's temporary and then the uh, witness will come and trace over the memelin with real ink. And the same question there. Rabbi Hanina said that gall water is valid. It's a permanent type of uh, ink. So then how could you use gall water in order to trace over? It's already written. And the answer is, depends on how the parchment was uh, was prepared. So the statement of Rabbi Hanina that gold water is can be used, that's where the parchment itself was not treated with gall nuts. Um, and so you have plain old parchment, you put gall nut water on it, that will be permanent. However, um, this uh, uh, um uh, Rabbi Abhu um, says when that when Rabbi Abhu says you can use it to trace over, that's talking about where the parchment was also treated with gall water or with gall nuts. So since you treated with gall nuts, if it gall water on top of parchment that was treated also with gall nuts, the they do not mix and the gall water will slide off and not be permanent on the uh, on the parchment so in that case if you have parchment parchment that was treated with gall nuts then you can um uh, write on it with gall water that will be temporary and then the the uh witness can sign with permanent ink on top of it so it really depends on the interaction between the writing material and the ink. Rav Papa Amar Berok. Rav Papa said another way you can help out these illiterate uh, um, signers is with uh, saliva. You just uh, trace the name in, uh, with saliva. It'll just be a little damp for a while, but just enough that you can uh, write on top of it with ink. And certainly saliva is not going to be permanent. And in fact, Rav Papa, the famous Amora of the fifth generation, instructed Papa, happens to have the same name, but the other Papa was an ox herder. And this ox herder, right, I'm sure he's very good at his job, but he was uh, didn't have a lot of education and didn't know how to write his name. And so Rav Papa, he taught him here with Rok, here, I'll help you write your name, I'll write it with saliva, and then you can just trace over it with ink. However, all of these leniencies that the scri- that the witness can trace over writing that's already uh, uh, that temporary writing with permanent ink, that we only allow this leniency for a get but not on the other documents. Why? Uh, for a get, because we don't want the woman to be an aguna, and if the husband is here and he's willing to give a get, and maybe tomorrow he's going to go off on a, on, on, on a trip or move away and never come back, or maybe be unwilling to give the get, and so right now he's willing to give a get. We can't find anybody right now that knows that knows how to write their name, but we have uh, an ox herder here and someone else there, that uh, that uh, is, is a kosher witness. Otherwise, they just can't write their name. So, in order to help a woman and prevent agunot, we permit someone to write a trace over um, a, a temporary writing. But for other shtarot, there's no reason to have that leniency, and we don't want to make sure it's a it's a full signature uh, from from scratch. In fact, there was a story of someone who did the name tracing for a different financial document, not a get, and Rav Kahana said that whoever did that should be given lashes. Um, this is not the proper way to sign something. It's not really, it's not quite a full signing if you're just tracing over what someone else signed. I mean, after all, you know, one of the ways to ratify a signature is to compare it with their signature otherwise. And if you're tracing over what someone else wrote, then is that really your signature, right? It's really some scribe or whoever does know how to write is kind of making a signature or a stencil. Whoever's cutting it out is creating a signature and the person himself is just uh, going over it. So how would you compare that to another a time another time that they sign it? So it's not, it's, it is problematic to use this tracing system. Uh, so we only allow it for a get 
but not in for other cases. Tanya kevate de Rav. Now back to Rav who said you can use a stencil. We have a Braita that supports him. Adim she'en yodim lachtom mekada'in lahem niyad halak ma'alina tekada'im diyo. The Braita says that if the witnesses do not know how to sign, so we cut out a blank piece of paper and then he can fill in the gaps with ink. Amar Rabban Gamli Shimon ben Gamliel. Bamedim imamorim begite nashim. Ava b'shichre avadim ushar kol shtarot im yodim likot lachatom chotmin v'im lav en chotmin. And in that b'raita, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel qualifies and says you can only use the stencil uh, um, uh, method when it comes to a get, but regarding uh, free uh, a, a document to free one's slaves or any other documents, if they know how to um, read and sign. So he introduces reading, which we'll ask about presently. If he knows how to read and sign, then the witness can sign. But if he doesn't know how to read and sign his name, then he cannot be a signatory. Okay, so now that we quote that Braita, which does support Rav, we ask, Kiriya Mandacha Shemer Rashbag. Well, how come all of a sudden he's introducing knowing how to read? It does, uh, above, you know, we, we assume that they're talking about the same case. And the Tanaka Maja said, if they don't know how to sign, then you do this. Rabash Rashbag all of a sudden says, and they don't know how to read. Well, what, why, why are we talking about reading? Okay, so we're missing words here, and this is the full text of the Braita. So there's a missing case. If the witnesses don't know how to read, then you have to read it to them, and they can sign. After all, they have to know what they're signing, and so if they don't know how to read the document, so okay, read it to them. That's that's okay, right? That's also like reading, like we do for uh, Megillah, uh, Sefer Torah, right? Someone is reading for us. The person who's reading the Torah or the Megillah is looking at the letters and reading it. We are listening, but right, that if you're listening to someone reading it, so then you know what's in it. That's fine. Um, so you read it, and then they can sign it. And if they also, if they don't know how to, how to, if they also don't know how to, how to sign their name, or they know how to read but don't know how to sign their name, then we do, then we make a stencil for them. And on that, Amar Shimon ben Gamliel should be Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. We can only do that regarding. Um, for other documents, we want a witness that knows how to read it for himself and sign it for himself. And we're not going to use either of these two shortcuts uh, that we're going to read it for him or make a stencil for him. That only is for a get, but not for anything else. And Rabbi explains what is why does Rashbag make a distinction and a special leniency for get, but not for anything else? If you can use it, if it's a kosher way, then it's a kosher way. It seems like Tanakama says this is a kosher way. You don't have to, it's like you don't have to read Megillah yourself. You can listen to someone else, right? This would be, would be fine for any document. Um, so the Tanakama says this is a, a legitimate way to to. Uh, uh, know what's in it and to sign. But Rashbag says it's not good for general general documents, so then why does he make a distinction? Forget, and the answer is so that the daughters of Israel should not be agunot, be deserted or chained and not be able to remarry. And uh, while the husband is here and willing, we find any two people that can be witnesses and will allow them uh, these uh, shortcuts. says, even though he's a minority opinion, we do follow that for halacha. But Rav Gamda Mishmed Rav Amar and halacha. Rav Gamda says, no, we don't follow Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel. So we ask, Vela Vela Keman Kerabanan. So then, who who are you following, Rabanan? Are, are you then it's even more lenient? You're gonna you're really you're gonna say that for any document you can use the stencil. Uh, method. We just had a story about Rav Kahana that someone used um, uh, one of these methods of tracing for another document and he gave him lashes. So how can you say that we followed a banan? And the answer is Tergema Kiriya. No, no. When he, when we, when he, Rav Gamda said uh, in the name of Rava that we don't follow Rashbag, he just meant regarding the reading um, uh, that uh, the, the, the reading is not like Rashbag who says you can only read for get. Um, we followed a banan for that. So if a witness doesn't know how to read, that's okay. For a get or any other document, we'll read it for you and now you'll know what's in it. That's totally fine. Fine. 
Um, but regarding signing, that everyone agrees we do follow at Ashbag, that the signatories for other documents do have to know how to write, and only for a get do we allow them to trace. Rav Yehuda Mista'er Kari Vehatim. Now regarding the reading, if someone doesn't know how to read, so we just said that's allowed, we're going to elaborate more on that. So Rav Yehuda, who obviously could read, he was a great sage, this is Rav Yehuda Bari Cheskel, the second generation, uh, Amora, student of Rav and Shemuel. But when he got older, it was difficult for him to see. And so uh, he would he would uh, struggle to see, squinting, looking closely, and read it, and then he would sign himself. And so Ula says, why does he have to struggle and strain his eyes to read? After all, Rabbi uh, El Azar, the master and authority in Eretz Yisrael, he would have documents read to him and then he would sign. Obviously, he could read by himself, but he was a very important person and so he had people read uh, to him and that was totally fine. And uh, also, in uh, that was in Eretz Yisrael, also in Bavel, Rav Nachman, Karu Kameh Safre Dayane Vehatim. Rav Nachman, he would have the court scribes read documents to him and, you know, he's very important and so he gets to just sit and listen. It's easier to do it that way. And then he would sign it. So you see these two sages, even though they could read, they had other people read for him. So Rav Yehuda could do the same thing. But then we say, Actually, this leniency uh, in Bavel was only permitted to Rav Nachman and the court scribes specifically. Rav Nachman, he was an important person. He was uh, connected to the um, the Resh Galuta. And so, because everyone is afraid of him, and especially the court scribes who worked for him and were subservient to Rav Nachman, so then they could be trusted that they would accurately uh, read and report what was in the document to Rav Nachman. However, if, uh, if it was Rav Nachman and other scribes who were not directly subservient to Rav Nachman, or if it was the same court scribes but a different sage that they did not directly answer to, then not necessarily, right? They might uh, inaccurately read it, um, uh, skip over something, right? They wouldn't be as uh, uh, interpretation and be as careful to report it precisely and read it precisely. And so therefore, this is not a good method. And that would explain why Rav Yehuda wanted to make sure to read it himself, even though it was, it was a struggle for him. And now other cases where rabbis who did know how to read uh, would nevertheless allow other people to read it for them. And this is a case of translation. So Rapapa, when a Persian document would come before him, that was made in a Persian court, and he didn't know how to read Persian. This is interesting because they lived in in the, un, under the Persian Empire, but even under the Persian Empire, there were many different languages, and the official high language of the government was not spoken or, or read by the common people. Uh, the rabbis knew some words, but they weren't uh, necessarily literate. Uh, fully literate in Persian. So the Papa did not, did not know how to read Persian. And so now the document comes and they ask him to um, decide on it. So he would do is, he would have it read by two non-Jews, not in the presence of each other, speaking offhandedly, right? It goes somewhere, so by the way, you know, what is this? Can you read the sentence? Uh, he wouldn't tell them that this is for an official document to uh, collect money because then they would be wary and if they were together they might uh, be in cahoots and trick the rabbi and so therefore if they have two independent people speaking offhandedly then you can trust that they're, what they're reading and what they're translating is in fact what it says and then he would validate the document and even allow that financial document to be used to collect from leaned property so Rav Ashe reports that Rav Huna Bar Natan said in the name of Amemar that if you have a Persian document but Jews signed on, this, on the document, it's in Persian language, then you can use it. It's a valid document. You can assume that whoever signed it 
and knows what they were doing and they were valid witnesses and uh, therefore it can be used and to, to collect from lien property. We ask, wait a second, but the people that signed it, the Jews, most Jews don't know Persian, so how could they sign it if they didn't know if they didn't read it? And the answer is but the these Jews knew it. Some some Jews learned Persian, and so if they signed it, when we can assume that they uh, they did in fact read Persian, or we can ask them, and they said they'll say yes, we know Persian. Hold on, if this was a document that was made not in a Jewish court, um, so it's uh, it may be written in a way that can be forged, and that is an invalid document uh, if it's written with uh, ink that can be erased. And the answer is no, it was written on uh, with with gall. Uh, the document was processed with gall, in fact, uh, um, and uh, the the uh, the parchment was was uh, treated with gall nuts, and therefore it was it's permanent. Hold on, another requirement to have for a document to be valid is you have to summarize the main point of the document in the last line and uh, most non-Jewish documents don't have that and the answer is Debim Hadar no in this one it did have it that's why um, uh, Amemar said it's okay to use such a document, but it has to have all these basic requirements. Now we ask, Well then, if, if it has all these requirements, uh, the, the 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 signatories know the language and it's written in permanent ink and it has a summary at the end. Then what is Amemar trying to teach us? To to teach us that you can write a document in any language? We already know that it's, it says Tanena, but it's actually a Mishnah. Later on, it says a get that you wrote in Hebrew and you signed it in Greek, or it was written in Greek and you signed it in Hebrew. That's fine. You can use different languages. Um, so, wait, I've had that Mishnah, I would know that's all true only in Gitin, but maybe it's a special leniency for a get. But not necessarily would I know that is true, you can write other documents in other language, and that's why Amemad came to teach us that as long as it has those other basic requirements, a document written in another language is kosher. Okay, a funny case of a man gives a woman a blank piece of paper and says, here, you, here's, here's, your, uh, here's your get. She is divorced. Now, this is very strange because it's a blank piece of paper, so it shouldn't be valid. But Shemuel never, nevertheless says, we're going to consider her valid because maybe it was written with me milin, gall water, uh, which has a characteristic that it, it's like invisible ink. Um, now, maybe it means that he just wrote it, so it's still wet, and so you could kind of see something if you would look carefully, but if you look after a few minutes or if you look from far, it's basically a blank piece of paper. And Shemuel says, well, listen, since it might be that there was um, some writing on it, we can assume that there was some disappearing ink on it, and she is considered um, uh, divorced. We challenge this. Now, here the challenge is from a Tosefta that says, a man gives his wife a document and says, here is your get, and then uh, she took it and destroyed it, threw it into the sea, threw it into the fire, um, or any way that destroys it. So now we can't later, we can't go and check what it was. And then later on, the husband, mean guy, he says, oh, by the way, that document I gave you was not a get. It was just a nonsense document, or either a, get, uh, a document of appeasement or a document of trust. Uh, this is a, a promissory, promissory note um, that shows that there's a loan, even though it's act not actually a loan. Someone might uh, ask someone to write that up for them, even though there's no loan, to say, hey, can you do me a favor? Just write that you owe me a million dollars, because I want to go show it around to show how rich I am so I can make other business deals, but it's not actually, doesn't actually 
actually reflect a loan. Or a document of trust is, listen, we're gonna, you're going to give me a loan, um, uh, but you know what? I'm going to write you a document that says you owe me the money from now, even though you didn't give me the money yet, um, because I, I trust that uh, you're going to give it to me. So it's supposed to matter a future loan. Either one of these is a, a type of loan document that actually uh, does not reflect an actu uh, any actual um, uh, obligation. Either way, neither of them are an actual get. He just took some kind of, you know, nonsense uh, document and gave it to her. And so then he says, I see you're not actually Megoreshet. I gave you something and now you can't check it because she threw it into the fire for some reason. Um, we do not believe him to make her prohibited, right? In both of these cases, uh, we say, listen, we think, husband, that you actually did give him a get, give her a get. And she, whatever, she destroyed it for some reason. And now you're changing your story just because you want to torture her and uh, make her not be able to get married. And so we, the rabbis, validate the get. Now, that's a tosefta. Let's analyze it. Tamadika ketav haleka ketav la. You see, the examples that it gave were something that was writing. Um, that's why we assume, look, we know there was writing on it. And so we're not going to believe the husband that the writing was a false pl promissory note. Rather, we're going to assume that it was a get. But the only reason we do that is because there was some writing on it. Um, and that's the examples it uses. But if it was a blank piece of paper, surely this baraita would not say we can assume that there was disappearing ink on it. Uh, so this is a challenge to Shemuel. No, Shemuel only said that we permit it when we check it. We check it with some kind of, kind of colored liquid that brings out the disappearing ink. And if when we put the and cuddle the liquid, liquid on it. Then we, if and we see the writing, then we say, "Oh, yeah, there was this was a get." But if not, not. In other words, you're right. We're not going to just assume that a blank piece of paper is a get. We're going to go check on it. Now, palet may have. Now we ask, okay, even if it does it make the uh, uh, make the writing visible, how is that? And how is that any good? Hashta hu de palet, right? And only now. Uh, it's expelled and becomes visible, but before that, it was not visible. So, Shemalname Haishin and Kamas is right. We're not sure that it was visible at the time that he gave it, but it's possible that it was visible. And since it was possible, we're going to give her the benefit of the doubt and say that she is considered. Uh, divorced, right? Because maybe at right, you know, just when he gave it to her, it was it was uh, visible, and then afterwards, when we checked it, then it became invisible. And so, as long as now we can ascertain that there was something on it at some point, um, we can permit it. Um, although, although it's true, we're not sure. Uh, so now Ravina said in the name of Amemar, um, who said that Maremar said this in the name of Rav Dimi, that two witnesses that, that uh, uh, are, are there um, uh, and the get is given in their presence, um, they have to read it. It's not enough for them to just um, to just watch the husband give some document to the wife. They have to look at the document first, read it, ascertain, yes, this is a get, and then see it being transferred. And that's the way to be a proper um, witness. Um, okay, so now we ask a question. We challenge it. Hold on, the Braita that we just quoted a second ago that says if a man gives a get to his wife and then she throws it and destroys it and then he changes his story and says actually it was a fake document, she is considered Megoreshet. And we're not going to believe him. Wait a second. Wait a second. You, but you said, uh, Ravina, that they have to read it. Well, if they read it, can the husband come and claim that, uh, oh, it was actually a, fa a fake document? There's no possibility. We'll just go ask the, ask the witnesses. You read it before, right? So you saw it was a get. We don't have to disbelieve him that now he's changing the story, right? We can just know for sure. So what, it can't be that you have to require them that that they read it before and we answer la serichi de bata de kariuha ai le le be ya de ve apeke mao de tema halufe halfe kamash malan oh no we need this uh, this teaching of uh, ravinan the name of Rav, ravdimi 
in the case where they did read it. Yes, they, the, the, the witnesses did read it. But then the husband took it and put it under his arm and he took out a document and maybe he was a magician and he did a little sleight of hand and he took out a different paper. So that's what he's claiming. You know, they read one paper. Magicians do this all the time. They show you one thing, but then they do a quick card switch and they present a different one. And so the husband might say, oh, the one that you read, I put it under my arm and I actually took out a different one. I gave her a different one. And in that case, Rav Dimi's Chidush is, we don't believe her, believe him. Maybe he's just trying to torture her, but we don't. Assume, we assume that he actually did give her the get. Now we have yet another story where we're not sure if the document that the husband presented to the wife was actually a get. The husband, you don't actually, actually, he doesn't have to give the get into her hand. He can throw it into her courtyard. So the husband threw it into her courtyard and it landed in the middle of some barrels. And they didn't bother to check right away uh, what it was. Or maybe they did go and check right away. Um, but they found actually there was a mezuzah. Uh, mezuzah there. And so now they're not sure. Uh, was there, um, did he actually throw a mezuzah? <laughs> right? A fake document, in which case they are not divorced. Or did he throw an actual get? Um, but since they waited some time to go check, maybe the get was um, destroyed or taken away by a mouse or something. And there happened to be a mezuzah also in the same spot. And uh, so it would make a big difference if she's divorced or not. Rav Nachman says it's very unusual to find a mezuzah among barrels. A mezuzah is an important, a holy item. It's expensive. And so nobody would just throw a mezuzah. You might throw an old receipt maybe among barrels, but not a mezuzah. Therefore, we have to assume that the thing that he threw is the mezuzah, and he did not throw a get, and therefore she is not divorced. However, that's only if when you go and look there, you find just one mezuzah. As if you find one, but if you find two or three, when we say mezuzah, we're talking about the scrolls, right? It looks the same from the outside as a divorce document, um, that if you find two or three so you say well all right i guess a whole bunch of um of uh, mezuzot were for some reason placed there or dropped there and um and this also was with them so it's not it's very unlikely that he ha he threw a mezuzah and it happened to fall in the same place where there were other mezuzot between the barrels so we can assume that the mezuzah was there and the fact that we don't find the get vigita emor achbarim shaklu we can assume that he did in fact throw a get but mice took it away at some point, and then in that case, uh, she would be considered divorced. And last story, It's pretty funny. Um, she wants a get. So he says, come to the Bet Knesset. He goes to the Aron Kodesh, takes out a Sefer Torah, and gives it to his wife. Says, here, hold this. Here is your get. Okay, so is that, what, and what, why, why would anyone think that that would be valid? Amar of Yosef, lemai lechushla. This is, of, of Yosef says, of course it would not be good. What are you worried about? Imishumemilin, en memilin al gabe memilin. If you're worried that maybe he wrote a, the document of a get on the back of the parchment or some empty part of the parchment, and he wrote it with gall water, which is disappearing ink. And so when we look now, we don't see it, but maybe uh, he just, he was, he wanted some extra parchment that he didn't have. So he goes and writes it on the back of a sefer to and he gives it to her, so maybe it would actually be a good get. Uh, um, so, uh, but we don't, we're not, that can't be because you can't write gall water, with gall water on top of gall water. A Sefer Torah is treated with gall water. Um, that, that's part of the treatment of standard Sefer Torah. And we already mentioned that while gall water on plain parchment is permanent, gall water on parchment that was treated with uh, gall nuts is uh, it slips off and is not permanent and therefore if they actually if he wrote the get on the sefer torah itself it would be temporary writing and so that uh, that would not be a possibility or maybe you'll say because in the torah in sefer devarim it says so it says that those those very words so he's giving her a whole sefer torah um, but what he means is i'm giving you here these words that says here is a sefer and this is your get but that can't be either because it has to be written for her sake, we already said. 
Um, and this Sefer Torah was written to be a Sefer Torah, it was not written as a get for this particular woman. And maybe you'll say that actually when the Torah was written, this guy already had in mind, you know what, I'm going to divorce my wife, and I want to write a Sefer Torah also at the same time. And so he gives uh, money to the uh, Sofer and says, listen, when you write this Torah, and when you get to that section about divorce, I want you to have in mind, this is going to be, I'm going to give this to my wife as a divorce, as a get. So maybe it is written lishma habayna shina shemo shma shem irav shem irav eleka. Yeah, but you also need to to have her name and the place name uh, uh, in it. And here, this is a sefer Torah, and it does not have the name, her, his name, her name. If you even make a change in the name, it's no good. And this is a sefer Torah; it doesn't have their names at all. Maybe if you count every 50 letters going this way and that way, right? But that doesn't count. Um, and so these uh, names are not in the get and they're uh, in the Torah. And therefore, there's no way that this could be good. So now we ask about this whole story. But Av Yosef, my Kamash Malan, why is Av Yosef even bringing this up? Why does he have to even discuss this case? Obviously, it's not good. And the answer is to teach us, She'en me'milin al gabe me'milin, that to teach us that gold water is not permanent ink when it's written on top of uh, parchment that's treated with gold water, because if it were permanent, then you might say, oh, maybe there was disappearing ink on, and he wrote it in the Sefer Torah, um, and it would be similar to the case of the blank parchment um, that we gave over, and we say, oh, maybe there was a disappearing ink on it, and over there we said, we, um, uh, we do consider the possibility that it was something written on it, but for Sefer Torah, which is always treated with gold water, um, it would not be permanent ink anyway, and therefore, for sure, it's not good. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen ve'amen.